शत्रु के जय कर घृणा एवं शत्रुतार मे शत्रु के जय कर कौशल दयालु अल्लाह सुबाना दिए पवित्र कुरान सुरा फसिलत सुरा नम्बर एक चल्लिस आयात नम्बर चौत्रिस हे नबी भलो और मंद कखो एक होते तुम भलो दिए मंद के प्रतिहत करो तुम देखे जे जरा तुम बिरोधिता करा तुम परम बंधु शत्रु के पराजित ना कर बर जय कर तर हृदय एवं मन के जय कर मानवतार समाधान Mike, welcome to South Africa. It's a pleasure having you here. One of the things that intrigued me about you is uh, you started your career in the medical field, in the scientific field, in fact, where empirical research is everything. How did you move from that, the world of science and the world of research and and proof, to the world of faith? The person who inspired me into this activity of propagation was Sheikh Ahmed Didad, the person from this great country. And the reason that I chose to become a doctor, I thought that it was the best profession for humankind, and it is. And I used to find pleasure in treating the physical body of the human beings. Later on, when I started treating the soul and the heart, I found multiple times more pleasure in it. That's the reason I transferred from being a medical doctor to a person propagating the truth of Islam. Well, now you have a global organization that's dedicated to the propagation of Islam. What are the aims and objectives of that organization, the Islamic Research Foundation? The main objective of the Islamic Research Foundation is to concentrate on the Muslim educated youth, those who go to medical colleges, the engineering colleges, and those Muslims who have an inferiority complex and who feel that Quran is an old book, 1400 years old, and the teachings of Quran, like man is allowed to have more than one wife if required. That a person should not have pork, should not have alcohol. All these teachings may have been good 1400 years ago, but today, in the age of science and technology, it no longer holds good. So basically, we have started the foundation to concentrate on these educated Muslim youth who are in fear to complex to prove to them that Alhamdulillah, the glorious Quran is far superior to modern science, and we do this with the help of Quran, Hadith, as well as reason, logic, and science. And secondly, our concentration is to remove the misconceptions about Islam from the minds of the non-Muslims. In touring around the world and talking to so many people, you must have come across various misconceptions about the religion of Islam. Perhaps you can tell me a little bit about what those misconceptions are. I feel that whenever you ask a non-Muslim, "Now, what do you feel is wrong with Islam?" he poses about four or five questions, and invariably these questions fall amongst the twenty most common questions. By my experience in the field for the past ten years, I've realized that there are about twenty most common questions which the non-Muslims have about Islam. For example, the most common question, as I mentioned, is that why does Islam permit a man to have more than one wife? And the counter question can come: If Islam allows a man to have more than one wife, why does it permit a woman to have more than one husband? They ask that: Why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the wheel? If Islam is a religion of peace, then how come it was spread by the sword? And they allege that the Muslims they are fundamentalists, they are terrorists. Then they say that. Islam is a ruthless religion, especially those who are pure vegetarians. They say that since Islam gives permission for a human being to have non-veg, it is a ruthless religion. And they pose the question that why does Islam does not permit the non-Muslims to enter the holy city of Makkah and Medina? And they say that if Islam is against idol worship, then how come the Muslims bow down to the Kaaba? 
these are a few of the common questions. That's a very interesting and long list of questions, obviously, that you are having to answer on a regular basis. But one in particular interests me and I think is very relevant in a world that is so sensitive to gender issues. You talk there about how often you're questioned about the inferiority of Muslim women, them being behind the veil. How do you respond to that question? The reply that I give is Islam was the first religion and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the major benefactor who uplifted the status of the women. The Western society claiming to uplift the women, according to me, they have actually degraded her to a status of concubines, mistresses, which are mere butterflies in the hands of sex marketeers, which are hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. Islam was the first religion which gave the due rights to the women. And when Islam gave the rights to the women, if you compare to the previous ages, the ages of Babylonia, the Greek civilization, the Roman civilization, the Egyptian civilization, the Arab civilization before the Quran was revealed, the women were only meant for sex and pleasure, and they were treated like dirt, and they were considered as a sign of the devil. In fact, Islam considered the women as a muhasana, as a fortress against the devil. And after Islam gave them equal rights, it expects them to maintain their rights. That's the reason hijab has been prescribed. And people talk about the veil or the hijab for the woman, but Almighty God in the Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman and any breath in thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. This is the hijab for the man. Then Allah speaks about the hijab for the woman. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of and to draw her veil over her bosom and display not a beauty except in front of her husband, her father, her sons, and a big list of mehram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. And the criteria for hijab is given in Surah Ahazab, chapter 33, verse number 59, which says that, O Prophet, tell your wives and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that it will prevent them from being molested and they shall be recognized. For example, two twin sisters who are identical twins and they're very beautiful, they're equally beautiful. If they're walking down the streets of Durban, and one twin sister is wearing the Islamic hijab, her complete body covered, except the face and the hand is up to the wrist. And the other twin sister, she's wearing a mini skirt or shorts. And they're walking down the streets of Durban, and around the corner there's a hoodlum who's waiting for a catch, who's going to tease a girl. Which girl will he tease? But natural, he will tease the girl wearing the Western clothes. That's the reason Quran rightly says hijab has been prescribed for the women so that it will prevent them from being molested. And the Islamic Sharia says that if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment. Many non-Muslims may consider this to be a barbaric law. But today America, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, on average, according to 1996 statistics of the US Department of Justice, every day 2,713 cases of rape are taking place. Every 32 second, one rape is taking place. I would like to ask you the question that if suppose we implement the Sharia in America, that a man when he looks at a woman, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. After that, the woman dresses up in the hijab, complete body cover except the face and the hands of blood. If any man rapes, you give capital punishment. Will the rate of rape in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? The West has often created perceptions about Islam, Western media, Western governments, where often Muslims and the religion of Islam is referred to as a religion of fanatics of terrorists. How do you challenge those perceptions? I do agree with you that the Western world, especially America, they are doing virulent propaganda about Islam. And you see in the media that the Muslims are fanatics, they are fundamentalists, they are terrorists. I have a different approach to reply to these questions. And I say that what is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? A fundamentalist is a person who follows the fundamentals. For a doctor, to be a good doctor, he should know follow and practice the fundamentals of medicine. You should be a fundamentalist in the field of medicine to be a good doctor. In the same vein, I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. I know, I follow and practice the fundamentals of Islam. I am a fundamentalist Muslim. For a person to be a good Muslim, he should be a fundamentalist in the field of Islam to be a good Muslim. But you can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. You can't say all fundamentalists are good or all are bad. If you compare a person who is a fundamentalist robber, he is harmful for the society. 
On the other hand, a fundamentalist doctor, he saves the human life. He is a good human being. He is good for the society. So you can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. As far as Islam is concerned, there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. And no one can point out a single verse of the glorious Quran which is against humanity in general. Due to the misunderstanding about Islam, they may feel that this particular teaching of Islam is against humanity. But if you know the background and the statistics and the real reason why Islam has implemented that particular thing, Alhamdulillah, not a single human being will be able to point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. Same with the thing of terrorist. Terrorist is a person who terrorizes a person. And one particular person can do activity and he can have two different labels. For example, when India was under the rule of the British, the Britishers, they ruled India for several years. India was one of the colonies. And there were many Indians who fought for the freedom. But the British government, these freedom fighters, they were called as terrorists. But the common Indians, they called them as freedom fighters or patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. So before we give a label, we should look at the different angles, the different views, and try and understand what is the view of different people. If you agree with the British government, you will call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the common Indian that the Britishers had no right to rule us, then you'll agree that they were freedom fighters, they were patriots. That is the reason, before you give a label, you should understand the background and the reason for why the people are doing the activity. Allah Kalam Quran Bustichan Quran Bustihole Shahayok Hishabi Quran Shangsish to Kichubishoy Jantehab Ebishoy Gulu Aluchito Hyeche Rulu Mul Quran Shironabe Rulumul Quran Shiriz Sunte O Dekte Amaru Pustapito Program Chokrakul Ekmatro Peace TV Bangla Ikara Okhaya Waratil Quran Isbah Bisotika Quran Ke Bhalo Bhabi Bujbar Jono Kiki Bishoy Gan Rakhajururi जानते होले देखून उल्मुल कुरान और इस्लामिया दोषो आज रात छाड़े आठ टाइम पापुनो शम प्रचार शकाल छाड़ टाइम बांग्लादेशे पीस टीवी बांग्लाए आम्रा ओने गुनाहेर काज कोरी दिने आर राते शकाल आर शंदाए जेने आर ना जेने किंतु किचु गुनाह रोए चे कबीरा जाता सुपाना हुआ दादा सकाल छाएंगे शिकार करता है बे मनेर धोत ताना होले जो को जवान करते पारे छोटो बोरो उन्हें एक भूल शरीयत विरुद्धी बहु काज अमी मोहम्मद आशिम मदानी जो को जिबेर आपूत्ते के वास्ते चान ताहोले देखून जो को जिबेर फोन शुद्ध पीस टीवी बांग्लाई जो को जिबेर कुफो परवर्ती अनुष्ठान पीस टीवी बांग्लाए The West has often created perceptions about Islam, Western media, Western governments. 
where often Muslims and the religion of Islam is referred to as a religion of fanatics, of terrorists. How do you challenge those perceptions? I do agree with you that the Western world, especially America, they are doing virulent propaganda about Islam. And you see in the media that the Muslims are fanatics, they are fundamentalists, they are terrorists. I have a different approach to reply to these questions. And I say that what is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? A fundamentalist is a person who follows the fundamentals. For a doctor, to be a good doctor, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of medicine. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of medicine to be a good doctor. In the same vein, I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. I know, I follow and practice the fundamentals of Islam. I am a fundamentalist Muslim. For a person to be a good Muslim, he should be a fundamentalist in the field of Islam to be a good Muslim. But you can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. You can't say all fundamentalists are good or all are bad. If you compare a person with a fundamentalist robber, he is harmful for the society. On the other hand, a fundamentalist doctor, he saves the human lives. He is a good human being. He is good for the society. So you can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. As far as Islam is concerned, there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. And no one can point out a single verse of the glorious Quran which is against humanity in general. Due to the misunderstanding about Islam, they may feel that this particular teaching of Islam is against humanity. But if you know the background and the statistics and the real reason why Islam has implemented that particular thing, Alhamdulillah, not a single human being will be able to point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. Same with the thing of terrorist. Terrorist is the person who terrorizes a person. And one particular person can do activity and he can have two different labels. For example, when India was under the rule of the British, the Britishers, they ruled India for several years. India was one of the colonies. And there were many Indians who fought for the freedom. By the British government, these freedom fighters, they were called as terrorists. But the common Indians, they called them as freedom fighters or patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. So before we give a label, we should look at the different angles, the different views, and try and understand what is the view of different people. If you agree with the British government, you will call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the common Indian that the Britishers had no right to rule us, then you'll agree that they were freedom fighters, they were patriots. That is the reason, before you give a label, you should understand the background and the reason for why the people are doing the activity. Yours is a particularly difficult job here, having to talk to so many people of different faiths about a religion that you're passionate about. Is there a way that you propagate Islam that doesn't provoke other people? The style that I follow of propagation is based on the glorious Quran. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Quran also says in Surah Anam, Chapter number 6, verse number 108. Revile not those who they worship God besides Allah. Abuse not those who they worship God besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the glorious Quran doesn't give permission for any Muslim to abuse or call bad names about those who they worship God besides Allah, because in their ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to do dawah with hikmah, with wisdom, with beautiful preaching. And regarding stepping back and looking at both the views, that is the master key of how to speak with various peoples, as the Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. Ya Ahlul Kitab, say, O people of the book, come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. That we associate no partners with Him. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Find Tawalla. If then they turn back. Fakul Shadu. Say we be witness. Be anna Muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The master key is come to common terms. If there are points of differences, if there are ten points, always all the religions have certain commonalities. So first, let's talk about the commonalities and agree that at least we'll follow these things and then we can, if required, speak about the differences. And this methodology is very successful. It doesn't hurt people's feeling. 
and it really opens up the minds of different types of people. In propagating Islam, is your approach provocative at all? Has there ever been an ugly incident at all? If you ask me ugly for me, I wouldn't say. But for the audience, yes. Because normally when a person speaks about religion, the people, the audience who do not belong to that faith, they think that the person on the stage is going to attack the religion. So mentally there's a mental block. That's the reason whenever I start, I read the dua which is mentioned in the Quran, which was recited by Musa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him, Rabbi Shuhali Sadri, wa yasirli amri, wa halol ugdatam mille sani, yafkaf kawli, from Surah Taha chapter number 20, verse 25 to 28, in which Moses, peace be upon him, asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that to remove the mental block that is there between him and the audience and the impediment from speech so that they will understand. During talks, we have people who may not want to be very peaceful and they do pose provocative questions. They do come up with things which will normally make a human being will retaliate. But the Quran says, Inna Allah Sabreen, that Allah is with those who patiently perceive it. So we as Dais, we are people who are propagating Islam, we have to be humble, we have to be soft, we have to be patient. There may be times when someone is trying to pull a fast one and purposely he's trying to take advantage of the situation. At that time we may have to be tough, but most of the times we have to be soft and all the situations for me, I mean for me it's peaceful. Inside I'm peaceful. I may have to sometime due to public speaking skills, I may have to raise my voice, that's a different issue. But normally, at heart, I'm peaceful. I think your job must be particularly difficult in India and uh, cities like Bombay. There's been increasing tension between Hindus and Muslims in particular, with a new government in place. How do you address those particular tensions in your own society when you're propagating the religion of Islam? Yes, there are high possibilities. And according to me, the common Hindu, as far as my experience goes, he is a loving person, the common Hindu, he likes meeting people. It is a few people, mainly the politicians, who are the people to blame to create these rights, according to me. It is the politicians who, for the vote bank, they are trying to create hatred between the two communities. Otherwise, I feel there is a great deal of things we can exchange. And we have been exchanging. I have several of Hindu friends and acquaintances. And believe me, Bombay, as you said, I do agree with you, one of the most difficult places to propagate Islam. But for information I like to know, that Bombay is the only city in the world where every day we show our dawa programs on the cable TV network for two to three hours to about 1.2 million homes. There is not a Muslim city in the world which shows three hours dawa programs every day and we show it to 1.2 million homes. The population of Bombay is approximately 18 million. We are successful, alhamdulillah, in showing our programs to satellite television channels that are run by Hindus. We show to more than 100 countries every day half an hour. We have our own satellite production studio. And initially when we started showing our program on the cable TV network, most of the operators are Hindus. We used to pay them money. Our programs became popular. Then they started showing free. Now they are willing to pay us money to talk to them about Islam. Alhamdulillah. Allah has his ways. Because my approach and the people, non-Muslim, they say, Zakir speaks about Islam, but we even come to know about modern science about latest technology, about the approach, about the latest thing that's happening in the world. So in this way, we are using a strategy that we have to educate them of different aspects, including religion. And when I quote, and when I talk about the religion, I always give references. If I have to speak to a Hindu, that you should believe in one God. I say it's mentioned in your way there, Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Nata Sipatima Asti, of that God, there is no image. I quote the Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, Chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ekam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means God is only one, without a second. And the major creed of Hinduism is Ekam Braham Dutyanaste. Niya naste kinchan. Bhagwan eki hai. Dusra nahi hai. Nahi hai nahi hai. Zarabi nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So when I speak, I quote the scriptures, give references. I don't hurt their feelings. Some people may agree. Some people may not agree. But we at least exchange the views and understand the religion in the right perspective. Can we wrap up with addressing issues that are pertinent in South Africa and have been for, for hundreds of years? The issue of racism. What is Islam's message about racism that Muslims and people of other faith should take forward? Most of the religions, theoretically, they do speak 
about universal brotherhood, but Islam practically implements it. The glorious Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaknaakum min zakrin wa unsa wajalnaakum shu'ubaw wa qaba'ila lit arfu inna akramakum in the lahiyat kaakum inna allah alimun kabeer O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of almighty God is the person who has taqwa the criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God, it's not color, it's not caste, it's not sex, it's not wealth, it is taqwa, it's God consciousness, it's piety, it's righteousness. Allah says in the Quran, Almighty God, in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 22, that we have made you into different colors, so that you may recognize, not that one person is superior to the other. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said in his farewell pilgrimage speech, that no Arab is superior to a non-Arab, neither is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. No white is superior to a black, neither a black or a white. In Islam, there is universal brotherhood. All human beings are equal irrespective whether you come from the Western world or the Eastern world, whether from America, from South Africa, from India or from Japan, you are equal. The only criteria that you can be superior is your righteousness, it's your piety. And we practically implement universal brotherhood in our day-to-day -day life minimum five times a day. During Salah, our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sunnah Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245, hadith number 665. Our beloved Prophet said before starting Salah that stay in a rose, stand shoulder to shoulder, close in the gap, do not leave any opening for the devil. The Prophet wasn't referring to the devil which you see in the museum with two horns and a tail, but he was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color, irrespective whether you're black or white. When you stand for Salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder irrespective whether rich or poor, king or pauper. When you stand for prayers, you stand shoulder to shoulder. This is the practical universal brotherhood Islam practices minimum five times a day, every day of your life. Justice, can we spare a little peace? the children of war. लोकार अपनर संपद के शुरुक्षित ना रखते पारे, विनियोग अपनर संपद के ना बढ़ती करते पारे, किंतु जाकात दिले निश्चयी अपनर संपद बार बे थक बे शुरुक्षित एवं कुवित्रो। इस टीवी शाते था कून अपनर जाकात दानी रोट्तो पढ़ते पारे आईआरएफआई अल्ट्रायन बैंक क्वार्टरन कोट आठ चुलिश कैल्थोर पेरोड I ban ZB Bando L O Y D Tin Shunno Noi Choi Tin Char Shunno Ak Shunno Dui Char Ak Noi Dui Short Code Tin Shunno 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 Art Tin Sweep B I C Code I B O B Z B Baish Taka Pachi Amadri Email Kurun Admin at the rate Peace TV dot TV Peace TV Manobotar Shamathan जहांगीरदुल्लाहान मुफ्ती काजी मोहम्मद इब्राहिम जहांगीर आलम सर्वशेष चूड़ान धर्म इसलम रिजिक तथा माता नन पिता नन मुसलमान एक आस्था विश्वास गोटा विश्व अल्लाह तला मानव जति के सृष्टि कर मूल इूनिट हलो बोझ जीवन बार्ता ज्ञान गर्भ आलोचनार मंच 
आज रात साढ़े नौ टाइम आप पुनः सम्प्रचार सकाल आठ टाइम बांगलेश